Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to New Day. And uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so maybe any one of us can please lead in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves once again before your presence. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak to us. Talk to us, Lord Jesus. Help us to understand your word in a better way. And we pray that you would make this time beneficial for each one of us. And also, we have been passing to mighty hands that you would speak through him. Help us to know your heart, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Okay, so... Uh, BC206 is coming to a close. We are almost done. Uh, I hope this has been a good learning for each of you. Uh, I really enjoyed just preparing and I personally sweat well learned a lot. Uh, so we've come to chapter 12. We've been talking about the pastor and last week we spoke about uh, the roles and responsibilities and rewards of the pastors. And so we saw uh, the, what are the responsibilities as a pastor? What must they do uh, both in personal life in terms of looking after the church and family as well? So we looked at a couple of those responsibilities and then we also looked at the rewards, right? We focused on how the Lord is our reward and how Apostle Paul also uh, says that, you know, uh, my reward in heaven is you, the people. So uh, and the fruit of our labor is uh you know is our reward right it's so wonderful especially as pastors when we see a church growing growing not only in numbers but also growing in uh, spiritual maturity people are growing in the word it's such a joy to see that right that it's such a rewarding feeling uh and and so uh this week what we'll do is um we'll chapter 13 we'll go through chapter uh, chapter 12 is the restoration of the ministry of the pastor. So what I thought was we will do that next week. But this week, we'll go to chapter 13. And since we are on the same uh, track of uh, the, you know, the responsibilities of the pastor, so we'll just look at practical keys to doing the ministry of the pastor. And we'll finish this in uh, this class, this one hour session. And then the next session, uh, you can you know feel free to do your assessment or your assignment, or you can just keep that time to study uh, uh, whichever course that you would like to. And then next week, we'll come back with uh, restoration of the ministry of the past. With this uh, and the week following that, I will not be uh, I will be traveling, so I won't there won't be class. So next. Thursday will be our last session and we'll do chapter 12. So this week we'll do chapter 13. I hope that's all right. right? Uh, okay. So chapter 13, uh, we have there a list of general responsibilities of a pastor. Now, uh, I know we've talked about it, uh, but there may be some repetitions, but let's look at a few general responsibilities of a pastor. First one, to pray and grow in relationship with God so that what is undertaken by the congregation reflects the leading of God. Right? Uh, again, we emphasize this as pastors. Uh, the most important you know, area of our life must be prayer. Uh, prayer and growing in God's word. As leaders, we cannot be in a place where we're saying, okay, uh, I know this so, I'm, you know, I'm comfortable in this. No, as pastors, our heart's desire must be that we continually pray, we continually grow in the things of God, right? So, for example, you know, you have a congregation of maybe twenty or thirty people. Now, as the years go by, eventually the congregation will grow, right? And so. Every Sunday, you we must be able to share a sermon or a message, right? And we can't, you can't give something fresh if we are still, you know, sitting in, uh, in a pond, right? Jesus said, "Rivers of living water shall flow." Now, how will that river flow? Unless we drink of it, meaning we need to get into God's word. Then we get something fresh. Stay fresh in revelation. Stay fresh in the word of God. 
uh, and this is very important, the moment leaders put prayer and studying the word of God secondary, then something's wrong. Right? Uh, I, I just remember this example, right? I remember I joined Bible college, and uh, when I joined Bible college, um, I just left the IT company and I joined. And I joined with one one thing in mind. I wanted to grow in God's word. Right? There was nothing else that mattered to me. I didn't care about the food. I didn't care about anything else. Right? What are the classes? What what are the timings? Nothing you know, bothered me. All I wanted to do, I had one vision in that two years to grow in the word, to grow in the spirit, and that's all to grow in my relationship with God. So uh, that was in my mind. But the moment I joined Bible College, I realized that, hey, uh, I'm doing things. I'm, I'm praying. I'm reading the Word of God. But a lot of my time is going to things that are not really important. And I thank God for, and that's why prayer is so important, right? I remember I, I, every time I pray, I said, I would feel like some things are not right. right? I, I can give so much more to God. What is wrong? Uh, am I spending too much time talking and doing all the other things, you know, we used to stay in a hostel. So all the friends, all the boys would be together. And then, uh, you know, of course we had a phone and I remember, uh, you know, every now and then while studying the phone would beep. Now, the thing was, I was also on the worship team that time. So I needed a phone uh, to coordinate with things in the worship team. And uh, so it was a common thing. But I realized at one point of time, the phone is causing me to stop spending quality time with God. And it is stopping me from spending more time reading and praying the word of God. So I, I switched off the phone uh, and I kept it away. But eventually, while praying, I kept thinking of the phone. What if somebody's calling? What if somebody's trying to get in touch with me? So many times I, I switched on the phone again. And then one time, I remember, I said, God, I cannot do this. Either I quit because I don't want to, you know, put you know, half Bible college, half my mind somewhere else. Either I quit or I choose to give my full time and effort towards Bible college. Uh, that is some, a desire for me, right? Uh, and I remember I went, I went to the restroom. I put the, toilet, the phone into the toilet and I flushed the phone I didn't want it because I wanted to grow in God's word. So two years, no phone. I, uh, I just didn't want it. And, uh, so many of my friends are like, why did you, at least you should have given the phone to me, but I just didn't want it. Uh, and the reason was I wanted to know that what I'm doing, I wanted to see God work in my life, right? And, and so when we desire this, God will come through. When we pray, when we seek God, right? Oh, it's an ongoing relationship. It keeps growing. And then you will see it reflecting uh, in the congregation. That's the most beautiful part. You will see it reflecting in the people that you're ministering to. You will see it, right? Two, focus on families. Uh, focus on personal families' welfare, that they are cared for spiritually, emotionally, physically. Now, we did talk about how there are great pastors and great ministry leaders who do a lot of ministry work, uh, but not looking after the family's welfare, right? Uh, they're very, very, they give 100% to the church, which is good. But they have, you know, not looked, not cared for the family. Now, the primary responsibility, right? I remember people used to give this example, right? So there's God, one circle, there's family, one circle, and then there's ministry, one circle. And I realized that's so wrong because it's a big circle with God, and inside God is family and ministry. And at the APCs, one of the things that we always we always emphasize is that it's first God, then it's family, then it's ministry. 
and some may say oh uh, uh, then you you know how can you put god uh, ministry third god is first right and second is family then is ministry so there will be times as pastors you will have to sacrifice you will have to you know cancel meetings you will have to say no i'm spending time with my family spending time with my children and that's a healthy thing to do because you know sometimes we may feel that you know our our comfort place is holding the mic and preaching that's our comfort place and, and we like to do events programs that's that's wonderful but in that process if we don't look after the family you don't look after the spiritual needs of the family emotional or physical needs of the family it uh, again like what we talked about uh, we'll be good in ministry but like as apostle paul says how can a person not look after his own family how can he look after the church of god right so as pastors uh, and as ministry leaders there may be busyness but take a break from those busy times spend time with family three seek god's seek god's vision for the church and be the primary vision caster for the ministry very important right now if you have a, a, your own ministry you see god's vision for that ministry god what is the vision that you want me to do you want have you have for me what is the vision is it to uh, uh, you know you, you'll get a feeling the more you you know spend time in god's word god will lead you so it could be the vision could be to touch lives uh, communities within the city maybe in the nation the nations or maybe uh, you know equip people in god's word that could be a primary vision just god's word another vision could be only discipleship right? as a church we want to be discipleship another vision could be just building community and fellowship so different ministries have different visions right another vision could be more mission minded right as a church we're going to go and reach out evangelize and start churches in different other places now not all of them may have that vision right so you seek god's vision for the church and two be the primary vision caster for the ministry if you get a vision from god for your ministry or you already have a ministry you already have a vision be the primary vision caster which means if we have the vision and we don't share it with the church there's no use how can i you know when jesus let's picture this when jesus came uh, and he started his earthly ministry what did he do he first thing he did he he told he told his disciples he chose the 12 disciples and he told them this is what is going to happen this is what is going to happen i'm going to be here for some time i'm going to be taken away i'm going to be beaten he's he's telling them what's going to happen but all of this but you will see that you know he he talks about this uh, through the sign of jonah he says just like the sun and like jonah was in the belly of the fish, same way the son of man will rise on the third day he's he's putting forth and he's letting them know that this is the vision this is why i have come here and um, uh, one day I'm going to go, I'm going to rise up from the I'm going to defeat the enemy. He's already shared the vision with them. And he kept telling them every now and then, he was, you know, uh, especially to the disciples, he kept reminding them, there's going to come a time, I'm not going to be here with you, but you will carry on what, what is being done. Right? And so when, they, when, they, when Jesus resurrected, they caught that vision. Oh, yes, Jesus said this. Initially, when he was on the cross, they didn't understand it. But after he resurrected the vision, they caught it. Okay, we have to do it. Now, Jesus is not there. But you see how the early church just took that vision forward. right? So vision is something that needs to be re repeated. As leaders, keep repeating it. right? Keep uh, Every time you have meetings, or every time you have Bible studies or... Uh, it, it could be just three, four people, right? And you could just keep telling them, hey, one day, you know, we want to see the church this way. We want to see, you know, uh, many hundreds of people, hundreds of lives being touched. We want to see small groups coming. We you just, you just share your vision with people, right? With the church, especially. Uh, 
and and then there are personal visions for example you know god is leading you towards something if you'd like to you can share it if not you can just keep it to yourself and pray about it but as a church uh, seek god's vision and keep reminding them because uh, there's a reason to remind them see we can go through the whole process of church come sunday morning finish church go home come sunday morning finish church go home it, it just becomes a process right you know okay sunday morning church and then it gets over and then we all go have lunch and then we go home we rest and then next day the monday starts yes it's a routine but if the vision is strong inside it doesn't become a vision only for sunday so in our mind it'll be hey monday i'm going to office or i'm going to uh, you know meet somebody in okay, i hope i can get an opportunity to share the gospel with them why because in church the vision is being repeated uh, uh, and so it can really uh, you know uh, affect and it can really uh, you know be something that can really minister to the uh, congregation right fourth one oversee the teaching and preaching of the word of god now you are as a pastor you will be in charge of preaching and teaching the word of god but you will also be in charge of protecting the flock and we talked about this uh, previous class as well right so there will be many doctrines many uh, false understandings entering the church but as pastors and leaders you and i must be able to protect the church right uh, protect them from wrong doctrines uh, and and also when it comes to teaching and preaching the word of god make sure that um, you know if you feel there are people in your church that can preach and teach the word of god one give them response give them opportunities right and two if you see that they're growing and they are uh, developing and you feel that they can be good leaders continue to give opportunities now the mistake sometimes what happens is uh, uh, it's happened in many places where you know a, a pastor may choose a young leader and this young leader is given a couple of opportunities and he does better than the pastor that he teaches or preaches better than the main pastor and everyone are talking about him and the main pastor if hey, everyone forgotten me they like this new guy and then you know we may not give them an opportunity again now that is the wrong thing to do right so uh, give responsibilities give opportunities our vision uh, our, our mission is to build people into Christ likeness right so uh, oversee the teaching and the preaching of the word of god right now this also comes to play when you know especially when a church once it keeps growing you're going to have something like small groups so other people are going to lead the church lead the small groups very important to make sure that every teaching and every everything that's being taught in these small groups and life groups are in line with the word of god that is why we at apc we have something called as life groups and in life groups what is usually discussed is what is preached on sunday so it's not some random topic which any leader can just choose and just speak about it no so what is discussed on like last sunday was my mind so we're going to you know just take a few pointers from that leave it open for discussion and then the life group leader just facilitates the whole uh, you know uh, discussion time so we know that all the life groups that we have across our city are talking about a Sunday sermon that was preached. Nobody's having their own teaching and all of that. Now, the teaching may be good, but we need to be overseers of that, right? What if they say things that are not in line with the word of God? Now, something that is already said is very hard to take back. Right? Uh, and so it's very important that you oversee these things, right? Uh, be the steward responsible for the administration of the sacraments now as of now we know the church has two sacraments one is the lord's table and two is uh, water baptism uh, so be good stewards of responsible for the administration of these two right so in terms of the lord's table 
very important that you teach you uh, about the Lord's table, you teach your congregation, make them understand, uh, lest it becomes like the church in Corinth, where, uh, you know, they, the church in Corinth, it's, you know, they were flowing in the gifts and they were doing all these wonderful things, but they were, uh, you know, they had immaturity in them. That is why the Apostle Paul was, you know, stern with them. He says, don't you have homes where you can eat and drink because you are coming here, you are taking the Lord's table whenever you all feel like uh, there's no order, there's, there's only chaos within the church. So in terms of administrating the whole thing of sacraments, ensure that it's done in an appropriate way, in an orderly manner, and uh, there's reverence, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a sense of, uh, you know, knowing that, hey, this is what Jesus did for us. Uh, and there's this joy, there's this freedom in the presence of God. So it's very important to teach the congregation. Now, the mistake that I made is many times I thought, okay, they already know. Right? Uh, they know, okay, you know, Lord's table, you should, uh, you know, be prepared for it, prepare your heart, prepare your mind. But over the years, I learned that not everyone know because people may be coming from traditional backgrounds to a spiritual church. Now they know I just have to take it because everyone are taking it. So it's very important to teach them, right? Uh, including people who are believers in the community, teach them, remind them, this is what Jesus did on the cross. And when we are partaking of it, this is what we receive. This is what we are opening our lives to, the power of the cross. This is what happens to us. And so when you're teaching them and you're administering this, these, the Lord's Supper, there's power in that, right? And including uh, water baptism. So uh, some of the things that we do, uh, a, a couple of practical things uh, that we do at APC, maybe you can also think of implementing that in your church if you haven't yet. Uh, one is uh, we have something called as a water baptism consent form. Right. So what is this? This is a form which if a person wants to be water baptized, he has to fill in this form. It's basically a consent form saying, I, Paul, Emmanuel, I'm right. I'm agreeing to be water baptized under this pastor, and this is the church, and this is of my own doing, and nobody has forced me to do this. Now, why do we have this, right? Especially in our nation of India, people may come up and say, you know, pastors, you're forcing people to be water baptized, or uh, you're converting people, and all these uh, allegations may come up. Um, so you have the you know, water baptism consent form. We also have a photo which is stapled to that form and it's you, you, some, it's sealed and signed by the uh, pastor of the church. So even the person who's being water baptized is signed. So that way, practically, we, we've done our part, right? Uh, uh, and then we also, in the spiritual aspect, we pray for them, we teach them what is baptism and the book of Romans talks about it, how and they're water baptized, they recognize with the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this practical thing is very important. Let me give you an example. There's this one time, uh, uh, a young man, a young boy, he's a student. Uh, he said, I want to be water baptized. And so I said, okay, uh, he's been serving in the church for more than a year also. So I said, okay, there's a water baptism consent form. So he filled in the form. We had the photo, we stapled it. And then I asked him a lot of questions like, well, is he okay? Is his parents okay? So he said, no, my mother is uh, a believer, but my father is a, a unbeliever. He doesn't believe in Jesus and he's not here. He's in another nation, uh, but this is what I want to do. And so the mother was very happy, but they, they, you know, filled in, he filled in the form. We did everything. We finished with the water baptism. And a couple of months later, I get a call from his father saying, who are you? And why are you behind my son? Why are you, uh, what did you do to him? You, I heard that you have, you know, done some ritual on him, and that is why now he's not getting a job. He's not getting. He's, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's nothing is happening good in his life, uh, and it was a difficult time. But 
uh, he said, uh, you know, I'm going to come back, come to India. I want to meet you. I want to talk to you. And he did come. He came and he came and he met me. He was really upset. He said, how can you do this? You know, you, you people are converting, uh, you know, our religion is in India is as a nation. You know, our religion is Hinduism. How can you change it? You bringing the Western culture here and all kinds of things. And I remember telling him, you know, uncle, I appreciate, I appreciate you. And I appreciate everything that you're saying. I understand your hurt and all of that. But this is your son's own doing. He's above 22. He's above 18 years of old age. And this is the form he filled in. This is the form that he signed. This is what he also wrote there why he wants to get water baptized. And he saw that in his own handwriting, his son's handwriting. And he completely calmed down. He said, OK, then it's not your fault. It's my son's fault. I have to talk to him. Uh, and the matter just was resolved, right? just in a few moments. Uh, it just got resolved. Practical step. Uh, but after that, you know, he went through his trouble where his father, uh, you know, troubled him. But he was stern and he was uh, confident in his faith. Um, so in terms of administering things uh, in, in, in the sacraments, teach, be, do the practical things, and then uh, make sure it's done in a responsible way. Sixth one, in all things, strive to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Uh, I think the number one uh, need for the church right now, uh, I, I wouldn't say number one, but one of the main needs in the church is unity right now where there is unity and where there's oneness is where it's beautiful the church is nice now imagine there's divisions within the church i think as a pastor i would never want to go you know it's going to be so difficult because you have groups of people with different ideas different plans and then they, you know that these two groups don't like each other and there you're ministering so as a pastor, our main, uh, uh, one of our, uh, you know, something that we strive for is to maintain unity. Now, to maintain unity, there will be times we may have to make hard decisions. Right? There will be times we may have to take stern decisions. But it's important for the church, right? Uh, maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. I uh, remember in First Corinthians, right? The Corinthian church is the best example, right? So there's so much there's division. Some saying I follow Cephas, some say I follow Paulo, some fo say I follow Christ, some say I follow uh, Paul. So there are different groups of people, and now Paul is writing and saying, "There's no how can the body say I don't need you? Can the eye say to the leg or the hand say to the mouth I don't need?" When you are in one body, you are all in unity with one another. So it is something that we have to strive for. It doesn't happen automatically. Remember that in a congregation, there are people, and people with different temperaments, right? people with different ideas, different uh, uh, you know, plans, different thoughts, right? Individuals, we're all different, right? We have different characters. Uh, but the responsibility of a pastor is to bring all of that together to maintain unity. Oh, just open to First Corinthians, and uh, there's one thing that the Apostle Paul did. I forget the chapter and the verse, but um, in First Corinthians, there are people within the church who are causing trouble, right? Uh, and I forget which verse is that, but it's in First Corinthians. They're causing trouble within the church, and you know Paul says to them, oh, "Put them out of the church for now." Uh, I think that verse is he says, um, "Hand them over to Satan." Now that's a big understanding. I, we must understand like Paul is not saying, you know, put them in Satan's hand. No, which means. Take them out of the spiritual authority or the spiritual control of the church uh, for the for for a while, right? Now there will be times. Sorry, I've, I'm 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 not sure where that verse is, uh, but it's in First Corinthians, I guess. So, uh, so what are we trying to get at now? 
to maintain unity within the church, uh, there will be times when we have to bring correction in a stern way. There will be times we will have to take drastic steps of requesting people to move out. Now, you may think, uh, oh, that is very stern. How can you tell a person to move out of church? No, you can. If they are disrupting, as a, if you feel as a pastor right, that this person is causing problems within the church, disrupting the unity of the church, for the sake of the church, right? first you give them an opportunity, you, you correct them. Two, you give them time to change. Three, if they do, you after a certain period of time, you don't see any change. You don't see any, um, you know, change in their character or the way they are, and you still see there's division and there's hatred and there's this sense of disunion. Okay, thank you, John. It's First Corinthians five five. So, if you still see that happening within the church, as a leader, it is your responsibility. You know, the mistake that I made many a times is that if somebody had a problem i would say okay you know it's okay just be be good don't 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 fight among yourselves and i would try to look at it in a spiritual aspect right? spiritually i would say hey why don't you pray god will remove all your hatred or you know but then i realize hey uh, this is a wrong way to deal with it the entire church is getting affected with this one person or this one family so I have to deal with it, uh, and and I remember I was very young, so I felt okay. These are people who are you know been in the Lord for many years, uh, but then you know I, I, through the advice of our senior pastors, other pastors, I understood that hey, I the church is important. Once this is out of the way, the church will be in peace. So for the sake of the church, you have to make be willing to make decisions. Many times I've taken the dust, put it under the carpet, and said, My church is the church is clean. It is not clean. Only thing you have to move the carpet and the dust is there. Right? So as pastors, many people will talk, many people will say many things. But if you are right, right, the psalmist says he will he will cause his your enemies to falter and he will cause you to be honorable in front of your enemies and that's a verse that i always declare right people may say many things and if you know you're doing things right in the eyes of god you're leading god's people in the right way god will cause honor over over your enemy cause you to uh, be successful and honorable in front of your enemies right and 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 so Pastors, you must be willing to make these hard decisions, right? Seventh one, establish ministries that seek to ensure that every member and prospective member is cared for in Christ likeness. Now, another very important aspect of a pa in pastoral ministry is member care. Now, you have members coming, people coming into the church. So they are different people, different individuals. How will you care for them? We must be able to care for them. It's not like they come, they sit on Sundays. OK, they're giving to God. They are growing in the word. So that's more than enough. So Monday to Friday, I will sit back. No. Right? So it calls for caring for the members. How can I do that? One, everyone have a birthday so you can call and wish them. Everyone who are married have a wedding anniversary. So you can call and wish them. Every family who have children have something or the other they would want prayer for or need help for. So you can be there for them. Everyone in the family will have people who will, you know, eventually pass away. So there's time of bereavement. So these are things involved in terms of member care, caring for the members in Christ likeness. Now, now at APC, we have something called as the member care team. Right? And in the member care team, we have one. OPC, we call it OPC because it's called one phone call. So every church member tries to get a call and we just talk to them. One, two, there's, you know, birthday wishes, anniversary wishes. Uh, there's uh, when there's a uh, death, you know, we make sure that we are there for them. Uh, you know, there's a there's a team 
in the you know just being there in the home for prayer and then there's another team looking after the uh, you know the burial and all the procedures a lot of practical things involved now the the family is mourning right the family is in uh, bereavement they can't go and you know do all the practical things of uh, you know signing registers and all of that that's not the time so as pastors and as a church we must be there for them right so uh, many other things right so there will be times of counseling times of uh caring for the members people will come and say you know i don't feel um you know cared for in the church now i can't say you can't say no if you don't feel cared then you look for another church so you can't say that right i need to be as a leader i need to care because they are my sheep i must be willing to care for them right and so we have different kinds of uh, uh people within the church be willing to care for them right uh, one of the things that i can suggest uh you know pastors or people who are leading ministries here is to is to form a team right uh, don't put the burden only on yourself because if you do so you may not be able to fulfill the whole thing right uh, it may not be too efficient so if you feel uh, you know there are 100 people in the church form a team of maybe 10 or 15 people right you have about uh, seven girls, seven seven men, seven women, uh, probably a couple of youth as well. Have them a team and train them up. Teach them how what is member care and what we want to do, what we want to achieve. And so when you're building this team, you'll know that you know you oversee the team, uh, but you know that okay, all members are being uh, cared for within the church. So if there's any uh, counseling need, any uh, material need, financial need, everything comes through the member care team or it can come directly to the pastor. But we know, okay. Now, one of the issues is that once we become 500, 600, 1,000 people in the church, right, it's a large gathering. And we may not be able to meet every need of the person. But here's the thing. As a pastor, if you start off something when the church is small when you really have a strong member care team as it grows the members themselves will feel that sense of member you know uh, there's a care there's there's people there are people who can look after us there are whenever i have need there are people i can go to so the culture of caring for members is already set in place right so that is why i, I always emphasize that especially small churches it is very important to build, to look at the vision. Okay, 10 years from now, if I want to be this, I have to start working from now. I have to start setting in this culture. Okay, this is the culture of the church. So 10 years from now, they'll know, okay, one thing we know about this church, this is what it is. If we need help, they are there. Or if we call the pastors, they're willing to come. You know, So set things in motion, establish ministries that every member is cared for right? so that could be member care that could be prayer cells that could be care cells that could be life groups that could be women's ministries men's ministries uh, you know workplace ministries so many ways uh, build teams eighth one raise up god's people into leadership of his church equipping empowering and supporting them their God-given ministry. Okay, uh, John has a question here. How do you avoid the pitfall of gossiping during member care? Uh, during member care, uh, John, I didn't uh, really get that. Yeah, so let's say uh, we are assigning people to call uh, people and um, uh, eventually <laughs> ending up uh, not okay, getting then. to know them and yeah, starting to gossip. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so that's what. Uh, so, John, one thing is when you're choosing leaders, choose them wisely. Right now, I, I know that there could be uh, times when, uh, you know, they may get to know each other and they start talking about many other things. Uh, so one thing good is to meet with them every month or maybe every two months, three months. Uh, meet with them and keep reiterating the vision with them. So the reason we're doing this is so that we can build each other up, care for each other, um, and we don't want, you know, you can openly tell them because that's a team that you are building. Uh, 
I openly tell them, let's make our calls more effective, avoid talking about things that are happening in the church. If there are, uh, you know, things that, you know, problems within the church or some issues or somebody is going through a problem and they've shared it with you, uh, you know, tell them that's all confidential. Don't talk about it. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, John, so the mistake I've made no, uh, is I've not told. I've many times I've felt, OK, they'll do it. They'll do it the right way. But I was so wrong, right? I was so wrong. So one of the ways is to tell them, right? Tell them, tell your team, this is what I expect. And this is how we should, uh, you know, uh, build this member care team. What is the reason of starting the ministry and why we are doing this? And also tell them that, you know, if you see that there's no change, let them know. Uh, again, as what we talked about, right? Let them know that you know uh, we may have to, after giving re repetitive corrections, we don't see any changes. Uh, you can tell them, hey, um, I I feel that you can you know just begin to start it, continue attending church, but uh, uh, take a break from the member care team. Right? Uh, but it's very important that you tell them, right? Uh, uh, meet with them, tell them, yeah. Okay. Um, Raise up God, God's people into leadership, very important. Paul raised up wonderful people in, in his life, uh, wonderful, wonderful leaders, Titus, Timothy, and many, many other leaders who he raised up, uh, uh, you know, just, just people who have, you know, Paul equipped them. I think the most beautiful example of um, you know, raising up leaders is Paul and Timothy, and I think every ministry uses that. Even Joe, Moses and Joshua, right? Beautifully, the beautiful transition. Moses led the people. Moses took Joshua most of the places that he went. Joshua saw the life and the ministry of Moses. Moses took on the responsibility, and we could just see that transition happening. Uh, and and look at Paul and Timothy. Paul chooses Timothy about seventeen years old. They, you know, they, the church said that he, he was a good man who uh, loved the Lord. That's all. No great talents, nothing. He loved the Lord serving in the church. Paul chooses him. A little did Timothy know that he would be in the books talking about him thousands of years later. Right. And, and here we are seeing that, you know, Timothy is raised up. There comes a time when Paul is saying he's a co-laborer with me. He's no more a small boy, 17 years old, just walking with me. No, no, he's a co-laborer in Christ. He's reached that place of maturity, and he's there in Ephesus. So uh, it's wonderful to see, especially as pastors and leaders, when we see men and women of God raising from a place from where they are to where God wants them to be. That is the greatest joy that we can find as pastors and leaders, right? Uh, yes, it's wonderful to see the church grow. It's wonderful to see the thousands of people coming into church. That's good. But I feel the greatest joy is to see a person from where they are to where God wants them to be. And that's that's wonderful, right? So that should be our vision always as pastors. Who can take up the next responsibility? Who can take up the next mantle? Um, uh, and Jesus did that wonderfully, right? He chose the 12. He knew they are going to take it up. And he says to them also, all of you will be seated, uh, uh, you know, in heaven. Uh, all of you will be there. I will remember all of you. Revelation says there were 12 pillars in there on the 12 apostles' name. But Judas is not there in that. But there were 12. Right? The other one chosen was... Uh, uh, in the book, uh, when when the disciples chose the other uh, the new apostle, but they they were remembered, right? So raise up godly people within the church. Let your life be an example to them, right? Uh, supervise the other staff of the congregation to keep the ministry in a common direction, aligned with the vision, right? Supervise, right? All of us as pastors must supervise. Don't feel that, okay, if I'm supervising, will they say I'm being uh, controlling? No. There will be times you have to put your hand down. You have to say things the way it is. 
right ministry is no more uh, i mean it's not about you know just saying okay okay to everything no there are times you have to uh, and there are times you continue to show grace and grace and mercy and uh, but there are times you have to bring correction you have to do it right uh, supervise the congregation see whether they're all in line uh, with the vision of the church provide spiritual direction oversee the development of the members uh, and to ensure financial time and talent support for the church and the ministry uh, this is very important again ensuring that you know financial uh, things that are happening within the church are used wisely time management within the church your personal time management time management in time in terms of the team everything is uh, helping and benefiting the church uh, be responsible for christian counseling or you can also refer people to christian counselors now uh, like for example we have as pastors you know people come up to us and they ask us you know uh, can you help me in this but there are certain areas they need you know additional professional counseling right uh, and that's when as pastors so in apc we have a team of professional counselors and we call it chrysalis counseling where uh, you know members people not only from our church but from other churches also they can come and be counseled professionally by professional counselors with biblical insights right so that is very powerful now we can only go to a certain point right so for example if somebody is in depression we can meet them we can pray for them we can do two or three times but then we know that this person needs professional counseling over time so we just lead them towards the right person who can counsel them be responsible uh, sorry uh, last one conduct services weddings and funerals now uh, this is a very important thing again uh, it's a practical thing but it's important pastors we will have to be able to conduct weddings funerals and other kinds of events housewarming you know house dedications baby dedications all kinds of things they call us to so uh, so we must be willing to you know just be there and be there for the church be there for the congregation right so we'll come to a close uh, what we'll do is next week we'll look at uh, the pastor the restoration of the pastor in the early church and we'll bring the course to a close next week and uh, uh, probably november first week i will put up your final assessment as well and uh, yeah any questions uh, any thoughts any questions before we close okay all right, so let's just close in prayer. Um, uh, Rosalind, can you please close in prayer? Or oh, anybody, anybody can close in prayer. Isaac. Yes, Pastor. Thank you, Isaac. Yes, Lord, we want to thank you for this wonderful session shared by our pastor. We want to thank you, Lord, and we want to ask that you continue con continue to shower him with inspiration and foresight we want to thank you for the class we want to thank you for all of us who are attending the class we benefited so much from these lectures father let it be part of us and let us be implementers and let us be an impact to others we want to thank you for the ministry we want to thank you for abc we want to thank you. We want to glorify your name. Father, let your name be honored. Let your name be glorified. Let us be the salt and the light. This and all other masses we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you very much, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I'll see you next week for our last class. Have a great uh, week ahead. And uh, take some time to uh, maybe complete your assessments as well. God bless.